like I said, very loopy. Good. Can you see Thank now? You. Yes. All right. Yes. So, uh, like I said, these are my collaborators. Um, and as I was saying, the second law of thermodynamics implies uh, Landauer's principle, which is that the uh, uh, energy acquired by the heat reservoir exceeds the uh, change in entropy of the uh, memory. Now, what this means for uh, practical computations where you're doing a deterministic mapping from an input to an output varies depending on the computation. Um, sorry. Uh, for instance, um, with in the classic erasure, this means that you require at least k t log two of energy dissipated into the heat path. Well, not dissipated, but sent into the heat bath for a swap where you're exchanging a zero and a one. For instance, you don't require any uh, energy, and for any sort of cycle like this, um, you uh, don't require any energy as well. Um, one of the main lessons of Landauer's bounds is that zero cost requires invertibility. So um, <clears throat> there must be some way to reverse the computation logically. And uh, Fredkin and Toffoli took this uh, to heart in their work on conservative logic in which they presented a gate which was able to do universal computing with um, no energy cost because of its uh, because of its uh, logical reversibility. So that's the sort of information theoretic analysis. But as we move towards, I apologize again for technical issues, um, but the slides are not progressing. And I appear to have crashed. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, with non-equilibrium thermodynamics, we can move beyond this analysis. Um, we can use the uh, very powerful detailed fluctuation theorem, which uh, relates the entropy production to uh, trajectories with inequality rather than an inequality of the much older second law, of, much older um, versions of the second law of thermodynamics. So just to reestablish what our framework is, we have some memory S, which is partitioned into memory states. Uh, for instance, we have some spatial variable here broken into a left half and a right half. And then we have some energy landscape parameterized by a variable x. Um, in this case, uh, it's a double well that has uh, can metal, metastably store either the left or the right. And then we have some uh, trajectory, control trajectory, x0 tau, in this case specified by a uh, barrier height and a tilt, which evolves the energy landscape as follows. And this then, um, compels the uh, states to evolve stochastically along some trajectory s0 tau and in this case perform something like computation. Now <clears throat> uh, it turns out that time reversal symmetries are extremely important for the detailed uh, fluctuation theorem because uh, the heat produced by a, um, a state trajectory given some driving trajectory x0 tau, um, that heat production is equal to kBT times, times the log ratio of this, uh, the conditional state trajectory on the initial state as well as the uh, forward driving trajectory over the time reversal of the state trajectory conditioned on the uh, final state with the time reversal and the time reversal of the control trajectory. So here we've, the, the time reversal of any trajectory is simultaneously 
reversing the indexing as well as reversing um, each state individually. <clears throat> so uh, as Paul mentioned yesterday, um, the many control restrictions lead to dissipation beyond land, land hours bound. And there's an extremely relevant uh, control restriction uh, in modern computers and bio biochemical computations, which is that the time reversal of uh, the control trajectory is itself. So this is time symmetric control. So with computers, you have some clock signal, which for which there is an uh, arbitrary length uh, time window under which this is um, time symmetric. And with biochemical systems processing DNA, the ATP uh, gives sort of a steady state dynamic that is essentially making the control parameters fixed. And in the example that I showed you before, if you look at this control trajectory, trajectory forward and back, it looks the same. So <clears throat> the consequences of this are, uh, uh, as described by Paul, that the energy cost diverges with reliability and um, due to the de uh, detailed fluctuation theorem. Uh, so with reliability, we're saying that the, uh, we have some nearly deterministic computation, such as this nearly uh, deterministic erasure and the uh, reliability is quantified by this factor epsilon. You only have, uh, you have probability at less than epsilon of mapping to any state that's not the de desired state by the deterministic computation. And in this case, uh, the dissipated work uh, bound, which can be calculated through coarse graining, um, approximately equals log of inverse epsilon times the average non-reciprocity here. So this is where Paul brought us yesterday. This average term here is the Iverson bracket evaluates to one when this is uh, equality is not satisfied and uh, zero when it is. So that means that when the computation is reciprocal, meaning that uh, the computation followed by the uh, time reversal followed by the computation followed by the time reversal maps back to itself for all states, um, then the computation is efficient because all these terms go to zero. And this is a stronger condition than invertibility. Um, <clears throat> it, the computation is guaranteed to be invertible if this is true because this is its inverse, dagger see dagger is the inverse, but uh, it's a more special case. So uh, what are we doing with this? We're looking at time symmetries. Uh, this dissipation depends intimately on time symmetries and time symmetries in memory uh, primarily occur through either uh, p uh, positional storage where say you have some positional variable and um, you're uh, under time reversal, this leaves you unchanged. So you flip uh, the direction that you're viewing the movie and everything, uh, the information that you're storing at any given point looks the same. This is the case for say DNA, uh, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine all look the same in reverse time. They're chemical configurations. On the other hand, another uh, common form of information storage, hard, a hard disk stores information through uh, little magnetic dipoles. Now, the thing about a magnetic dipole is that under uh, time reversal, they flip. So if this uh, up dipole stores zero and this down dipole stores one, a time reversal maps zero to one and one to zero. So we have a little involution. Uh, uh, operating as time reversal. So what does this imply for our uh, bound? It implies uh, that, well, for the spatial case, we have this uh, sort of a visual way of evaluating the non-reciprocity. So we evaluate the forward computation. So these are the forward arrows 
And then in the reverse direction, we look at the reverse computation, which is dagger C dagger. And we can, by I, estimate um, the dissipation by following the arrows and seeing when you map back to yourself under the full uh, computation, uh, C dagger C dagger. So here we see um, this, this state, the zero state under a reliable uh, erasure, uh, maps to this state, but does not map back to itself under the reverse computation. So that state is unreciprocated. On the other hand, the one state maps forward and maps back under the reverse computation. Um, and that means that the, uh, the minimum dissipation is approximately equal to log inverse epsilon over one half because one half of the states are uh, non-reciprocal. So uh, more generally, we can quantify this in terms of a dissipation divergence, which is a function of both the computation and the time reversal symmetries of your um, system. We, uh, this is the limit as the epsilon as the reliability goes to infinity, as epsilon goes to zero of the dissipated work over log of inverse epsilon, and can be expressed in terms of the, these two matrices, uh, dagger and C defined here. So we have, say, a more complicated um, computation operating on spatial variables, and you can visually identify uh, the reciprocity here through the matching of arrows. We have this initial state, um, maps forward and maps back to itself. This initial state maps forward, maps back to itself. The only state that doesn't do this is this state right here. And it maps forward and then maps to this state. And so we have uh, the dissipation divergence is equal to one fourth. Now, with this ability to easily calculate how the dissipation divergence changes based on the type of memory, our question is, what type of memory is best? Well, um, we can evaluate this for one-bit operations. Do this little game. We look at every possible one-bit operation, deterministic one-bit operation, and uh, map the forward and the reverse computation. And it does look different. Uh, the reverse mapping is different for magnetic storage and positional storage. However, on average, the non-reciprocity is the same. For these two uh, erasure computations, there's uh, a dissipation divergence of one half. For these uh, two reversible ones, there's a dissipation of zero. So we move on to two-bit computations. Now with two-bit computations, there's more flexibility in how you design them. You can have two positional bits. You can have two magnetic bits. You could mix them up. Uh, depending on how you do this, the time symmetries which are determined or which are shown by these dashed lines change. So these mixed storage uh, bits are similar to magnetic storage bits in that they always have a pair that they map to. And we compare the positional, uh, we can set, so compare the positional dissipation divergence to the magnetic dissipation divergence for the full suite of two-bit computations, making this histogram here. So every point set tells you the number of computations that falls into this region. So for instance, uh, somebody is drawing on my screen right now. I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, uh, so for instance, we have a, um, a dissipation uh, the dissipation divergence of a positional bit goes from zero to uh, one here, as does the magnetic bit. And we have cases on the edge where we have sort of a computation to memory matching. So we have that different uh, memory types are more suited for different computations. The computations in this edge perform very poorly for positional memory, but because they dissipate maximally, but very well for magnetic memory because they dissipate nothing at all. Uh, conversely, this is, these computations here are very bad for magnetic memory, but very good for positional memory. However, 
you will notice that this is a symmetric plot along this axis, which indicates when you consider all possible computations, there's no net advantage to magnetic memory or positional memory. So if we're considering the full suite of computations, there's maybe no reason to um, choose one over the other. However, there are uh, to clearly certain computations where it's worth choosing one over the other. Um, to see these extremal cases, consider the following two computations. One which is a four cycle, and with positional storage, there is no reciprocity. Every state um, maps, does not map back to itself. On the other hand, for magnetic storage, uh, every state is balanced. You have this forward mapping and this backward mapping for every state, meaning that you're divergently dissipated for the positional, but you don't dissipate anything for the magnetic. Conver conversely, this, uh, uh, this joint of an identity map and a swap performs very well for positional storage because of reciprocity, but very poorly for magnetic storage. And more generally, we can consider all these different computations which give us examples uh, that are maximized or have dissipation maximized or minimized for positional memory, mixed memory, magnetic memory in different ways. So this suggests a huge amount of flexibility in the dissipation due to the actual form of memory storage. And the question is, how low can we go? Well, I mean, it's... Uh, it turns out that we have proved a lower bound on how low we can go and uh, it is a function of only the computation. It is insensitive to the time symmetries. So this is a lower bound uh, using uh, which uh, this, sorry, the dissipation divergence is lower bounded by the one minus the rank of the computation over M. So the rank of the computation is the total number, total number of destination states uh, and therefore, the dissipation divergence is equal to the fraction of states which are not mapped to, given here, which in this case is one fourth. Now the question is, is this lower bound meaningful? Is it achievable for some memory device? Well, in order to know that, we need to know about what the space of uh, time symmetries looks like. So every uh, time, time symmetry is an involution, meaning that uh, when operated twice, it maps to itself. But we've also shown that every uh, involution can be realized by some memory device uh, by coarse graining magnetic dipoles. So the basic idea is that you create a very large memory with many magnetic dipoles that each have uh, a swap between elements. And then you can coarse grain in two different ways. In this case, you can coarse grain two states which are the time reversal of each other into a single state C that maps to itself, or you can coarse grain two states that are not time reversals of each other and also coarse grain their time reversals as the case with A and B. And what you get is going, going from four states with a swap to two states with a swap. So in this way, you can design the number of swaps in identity maps, which can compose any evolution. And it's worth noting that it's impossible to construct such a memory uh, with positional variables. So we have much more flexibility with uh, magnetic memory, with time reversal asymmetric variables. Now, once we know this, we also find that we can design memory for any particular computation such that it achieves the lower bound. So any computation here is, uh, can be shown through this graph, and then we can make a number of cuts in this graph such that it's broken into a series of line components and cycle components. And I'm, I guess I'm showing you this not so much to explain the full details of this, but to suggest that there are some interesting uh, graph theoretic things you can do to design the involution. So you can index uh, all these components, e each component, such that the components 
increase as you follow the computation and then choose the involution um, in the following way such that you map to yourself under the computation followed by the involution followed by the computation followed by the involution again as much as possible and in this case the only states that don't map to themselves are the ones at the end of line components and this gives you uh, that uh, that you're achieving the lower bound and this is only zero when the computation is invertible like with Landauer's bound so just to summarize um, this means that non-reciprocity leads to divergent uh, computation far beyond Landauer's bound for reliable computations and dissipation divergence depends intimately on the time symmetries of memory. So this was suggested by Paul e earlier, but we see in much greater detail how flexible we are. Uh, we also derived a lower bound in terms of the rank of the computation matrix and showed that the bound is achievable through memory constructed from magnetic magnetic dipoles. And we've arrived at the same design principles as we originally had with Landauer's bound, but they're suggested much more strongly because the cost of non-invertibility is much higher for these time symmetrically controlled systems like uh, you know, biochemical computers or digital computers. So with that, thank you. And uh, do we have any time for questions?